Hi, this is Serena Sun, founder and director of Breaking Taboo, and today I'm sitting here with Moses Farrow, who's an LMFT, otherwise known as a licensed marriage family therapist, who specializes in adoption trauma therapy, which is quite unique, and he is also the co-founder of the Guide Foundation. So hi, Moses, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thanks, Serena. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this video audio podcast. Moses, I want to chat with you about your specialty. This is very unique. Um, adoption trauma therapy. So that's something that is pretty new to me. I uh, The first time that I heard of it was through you. So uh, what is that? What is adoption trauma therapy? Adoption trauma therapy is... <laughs> something that um, isn't often talked about and really not really talked about in the trauma circles. Um, so we're getting more and more familiar with PTSD, with trauma being becoming trauma-informed, understanding um, the, uh, the idea of flashbacks, the idea of intrusive thoughts, uh, the idea of uh, trauma cycles. Um, but the thing that uh, doesn't get factored in when thinking about trauma um, and how you get into this fight or flight mode uh, with adoption, it adds another, uh, another layer, maybe another several layers um, to consider when diagnosing, when thinking about the presentation of, um, of trauma. It's really important to bring up the adoption factor. Uh, because uh, what, um, what often doesn't get captured when talking about adoption is what happens right before, which is the relinquishment. Um, the uh, uh, United Nations had recently come out with um, a report that said 80% uh, of children in orphanages are actually not orphans, that they do have living relatives. Uh, and living parents. Wow. So, yeah. Um, uh, the majority of us uh, are uh, either looking for uh, connections to our birth countries, uh, mm -hmm. to our birth families, uh, to our birth co uh, cultures, um, all of which uh, are tied together with this initial loss, this initial relinquishment, um, which is traumatic. Now, do most people remember being relinquished? Um, or did you know of any stats around um, typically adoption-wise, when do people get put up for adoption? Or does it just vary? Is it very widespread? It, um, it is widespread. I would say the preference for adoptive parents is to start early. You know, so mm -hmm. infants, babies. Um, when uh, we talk about international adoptions, uh, it can take uh, up to a few years for the adoption process to finalize. Uh, so um, there are a number of uh, uh, older child adoptions. Uh, it's, um, I'd say, more prevalent among uh, the foster care population. Uh, but um, there are older child adoptions uh, overseas as well. So I would say just across the board, it's, it's pretty widespread from infant to um, uh, young children to adolescents. And what's considered older child in the adoption world? Um, I, I would say uh, anywhere past uh, toddlerhood. Um, wow. So... Wow, that's, I mean, that's a lot <laughs> from toddlerhood to the age of 18 is, that's a, a lot of years. So, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, uh, I'm assuming once you become a toddler after that, is it the chances of being adopted? Does it go down? I do feel that uh, the preference is more for uh, infants and babies. Um, but there are older child adoptions, and we're talking about, uh, uh, again, the 6, 7, 8 to 12, 13, 14 
um, you know, through the teenage years. Uh, when they get to, you know, 16, 17, 18, uh, we start hearing stories of how they just age out of the, out of the system, out of the foster care system. Mm-hmm. Um, so and some people never get adopted, right? That does, that does happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does it happen quite often, would you say, or is that more rare that they never get adopted? Uh, well, what I'll say about that is it happens too often. Mm, I see. I see. Uh, the one way I can relate to it actually is uh, I've, I've uh, volunteered at the pet shelters, you know, since the age of 13. And uh, it's the same thing. Um, it's always like the young little kittens and puppies that get adopted first. And then if, if there are any like full grown animals, they, their chances of being adopted are, uh, at least in the shelters, significantly lowered by at least like, you know, they have at least like less than 50% chance of um, being adopted when compared to the younger ones. So, and often they're euthanized um, in a few weeks and it's really sad. So, oh my gosh. yep. Mm-hmm, that's, yeah. It's tragic. Yeah. yeah. So I, I remember I used to always walk the, try to walk the ones that, that were uh, a little bit like older and, you know, um, uh, seemed like they had a lesser chance of, of getting adopted because at least, you know, you're giving them a walk or, yeah, <laughs> they are changing. I think at Los Angeles County, at least uh, they just passed a rule where it's become no kill. So the LA County Animal Services have become a no kill animal shelter. And, and that's huge because there are so many mm. of them and we would get so many animals. So, so thankfully they're no longer being euthanized there. But it's still happening mm-hmm. all over. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the world of adoption is so interesting. One of my favorite books is White Oleander. Have you ever heard of it? I've heard of it, yeah. Okay, you should read it. This author spent, I think, over 10 years of her life working on this novel. And it's about the foster care system. Uh, It takes place in Los Angeles, California, Southern California. And it's about how this girl just gets thrown into the foster foster care system. And uh, just even in reading it and all the different scenarios that she got placed in, like, like, of course it's traumatic. I mean, she was like placed in really bad homes. I had no idea until I read this book how how bad it could be where you know some of the homes like they just didn't have good caretakers because they just wanted the money you know and so they would like lock up the food or not feed them enough or just abandon them or neglect them or abuse them or she even got shot I mean of course it's a fictional book but I think the the point is that this happens um, more often than people realize in the foster care system and there's a lot of trauma associated with it so Mm -hmm. do you have any any thoughts on that? Uh, well, it, it sounds it sounds very much uh, realistic, unfortunately. Mm. Um, wow. What what you know? What I can say, Serena, is there there is this initial traumatic loss that all adoptees have to experience in order to be adopted. But it it is really more about uh, the multiple layers of trauma, and then multiple occurrences of trauma over the course of your lifetime. Um, and so I want to back up just a little bit uh, because we're, we're talking about adoption, which is really a huge, huge um, topic. Uh, and there are so many different types of adoptions. And we've kind of interwoven international, intercountry, domestic, uh, foster care, uh, so I want to, you know, make sure that uh, we are clear about, uh, you know, just the different types, the the overarching range of um, adoption experiences, um, you know, let alone transracial adoptions, um, which, uh, you know, happen quite often. Uh, the the unfortunate um, thing that we, we do hear quite a bit about is the the ongoing um, uh, moving from one foster home to an, another for, you know, foster placement children. And why is that? Why does that happen so often? Um, well, a bit of what you were describing, that uh, there are foster homes that uh, aren't well equipped, that, um, that do uh, experience abuse, um, that um, 
uh, the behaviors become so uh, overwhelming, um, you know, that uh, uh, the child ends up getting placed uh, and then quite possibly placed multiple times, um, you know. So if you can imagine uh, starting off with this initial traumatic loss from the birth mother uh, and birth family, uh, then uh, having to move from one foster home to another. Um, and, you know, foster placements, um, uh, if, we're, if we're talking about uh, on the domestic side, uh, where the majority of them have to do with um, uh, issues in the birth family home, uh, you know, so if there was initial abuse or neglect, uh, where the state agency, whether Child Protective Services or Department, Department of Children and Families, they have to step in and then take custody of that child. And during the time that the, the, uh, the mother, the family is going through some kind of treatment or uh, working on um, uh, working through some conditions that uh, the state agency places on them in order to have their child return to them. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, quite a bit of time that can go by. So mm -hmm. the, the child, you know, is, uh, it's deliberated on where they should be placed in the meantime. Mm -hmm. you know? So whether there's a, a natural resource like another family member or a foster placement. Um, and uh, foster placements can, can be as short as, say, uh, 24 hours mm -hmm. or, you know, a number of years. So um, there, can, there's quite a bit of disruption. Uh, can, can I ask you, were you adopted? Is this from personal experience that you got involved in this? Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I am adopted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, at what age were you adopted? I was um, uh, around two uh, oh, okay. when when I flew from uh, Seoul, Korea, to uh, uh, to the United States. You know, to the U.S. Okay. And um, so I so I'm a um, an inter international intercountry transracial uh, adoptee. So your U.S. parents flew to Korea to get you, or how does that whole process work? Um, there are some countries that uh, uh, either require or um, recommend that uh, the adoptive parents uh, goes to visit uh, during the adoption process. Um, uh, for Korea, uh, I don't believe that is a requirement. Uh, mm. So, um, so yes, uh, uh, it's not um, it's not necessarily uh, always the case. Do you remember it? I can't say that I do. Mm. Okay, uh, I was telling you earlier during our phone call that I am not adopted. However, had a, a very similar experience of being um, given to new caretakers because I immigrated here with my grandmother from China. Uh, but this happens a lot in Asian families where, uh, you know, one, one parents will come out here for, to study or for a job opportunity or something. They'll, and the, they'll have to leave their child because of either money or visas or, uh, you know, I don't know how, how it used to work back then. I think it was, it was quite hard to get people in here. So my dad left me, my mother left me uh, when I was, my dad left when I was eight months old. And then my mother left when I was a year and a half. I don't remember either one of them. But when I was in China, I was with my grandmother. So I remember her. So she's my primary caretaker, like the, the first one I knew when I was younger. And then when I came to America, I was given to totally new caretakers. And that was my mom and my dad, who were strangers to me, like when I mm. first saw them. And completely did not know who they were. And I was really scared. I remember being really scared because all of a sudden now I had to listen to them. I had to like be in their house. I had to, you know, do what they said. I was just like in a totally new situation. So um, 
Yeah, that's definitely something that I realized later um, through doing psychology and therapy and stuff that I realized it does have an impact on you, definitely has an impact on you uh, growing up, um, you know, so it, it took me years and years of development, self-development work to get mm -hmm. through the old attachment issues that I had because of this. You know, so um, I'm sure a lot of uh, children who were adopted who do remember probably go through go through um, similar things. Uh, how do you think it affected you, Moses? Or did it affect you? I mean, I'm sure it did. <laughs> well, uh, yes, uh, yes, it's definitely a, a lifelong process. Um, and, and and Serena, I I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and, and, you know, in a way, um, if we're looking at the definition of adoption, uh, it's, um, I think the, the dictionary uh, definition is the, the legal action of uh, taking uh, someone else's baby and bring them into your family, um, mm -hmm. raising them as your own. We are at a critical time of redefining what adoption is. Uh, there's many of us who are advocating for adoption reform in many different ways. And this is um, something that has been developing for a number of years. Uh, so just for the uh, Adoption or Adoptee Citizenship Act, uh, this is something- So what that is that? Exactly, like what kind of reforms and what does that mean? So right now, um, and, and forgive me for not having the, the exact number, but there are tens of thousands of adoptees who did not uh, receive legal citizenship. Oh, why during, is that? Is, it, is that because uh, it was done under the books or is that just how the process of adoption makes it difficult to, to do that? Um, I want to say that uh, uh, a number of them, it was an oversight during the adoption process. Oh, uh, that's a something, big oversight. It is something that should be done uh, as part of Bring, bringing a, a child from another country into this, this country. Has my adoption uh, affected me or how has it affected me? Uh, as I've grown up, uh, and it's taken me a while, uh, I, I realize that there are things about being adopted that need to be brought up, that need to be pointed out, that need to be uh, uh, addressed and need to be rectified. So, like what uh, things uh, besides the citizenship things? Um, what what thing? What else do you feel like needs to be rectified in adoption? I mean, I have a question. I guess that maybe this is part of it, but I've always wondered. There's so many kids out there that need homes, like so many. You know, there's so many kids that that need to that that should be adopted, and um, not even just this country, other many other countries as well. But why is it so hard? Why is it so difficult? Because I know the adoption process is not easy. It's quite difficult, at least here in the U.S. And I know a lot of parents want to adopt, but either a they don't have the financial means, or b like they I don't know whatever tests they don't pass, or it just takes a really long time. Why is it so difficult <laughs> to adopt? Mm. Well, I really appreciate you putting this on the table. So, uh, <laughs> is this one of the things that you want to rectify or you think needs reform? So there, there is uh, an ongoing uh, debate, if you will, about um, the value of adoption. You know, are, mm -hmm. are you for adoption or against adoption? Um, this is this is something that's going on. Uh, How can you be uh, against adoption? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> you don't think people should be adopted, or right? So, <laughs> what? Yes, yes, uh, Serena, uh, you are tapping into um, uh, a larger conversation here. So I'm. I'm well, let's break the taboo. Let's let's break this yeah. taboo because I'm I'm quite curious and also amazed and shocked like 
who would be against adoption? I don't understand. I don't understand that. If kids are in foster care, they don't have parents. I don't understand, like, why should they not be adopted? Okay. Okay, Serena. Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you for being willing to listen because we're going to break this taboo right now. Okay. All right. Let's do it. What is it? <laughs> yes. So <laughs> Eager learner. Uh-huh. <laughs> Remember how we ju- we were just defining what adoption is? Right. Well, uh, but, wait, can you define it again? So the dictionary version, right, is just, it's a legal action of taking someone else's child and raising them as your own, mm-hmm. right? Um, we defined it as the full range of adoptions, domestic, foster care, international, intercountry, transracial, But now we're going to expand it even more, right? So I didn't bring up or we haven't touched on um, artificial insemination. We haven't touched on surrogacy. Uh, We we haven't touched on um, the uh, uh, rehoming practices. Now, let's let's dive into this one. So rehoming doesn't go through... um, any uh, uh, legal action. It, there, there was um, an investigative report uh, by Reuters um, a number of years ago that uncovered a, a Yahoo group uh, ring that was just placing children from one home to another, uh, basically uh, uh, putting children up um, online and saying, I have this child and uh, whoever would like, wh- whoever would like them, uh, can take them. Um, and there were thousands of these kinds of cases. Um, so there's that aspect where this is just starting to um, say this doesn't feel right. Sorry, it's this not is really where. Look- who who was doing this? Who was putting children? Uh, and were these? I mean, did they steal these kids? I mean, what 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 was the scenario here? Sorry, could you repeat that? Who was doing this? Here here in the U.S. Oh, okay. It was it was done online. It was just illegal, basically, like child trafficking or something. It's just yeah. Well, so that's the door that we're opening. Is uh-huh. that uh, uh, a lot of people consider adoption to be child trafficking? human trafficking, sex trafficking. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Wait, uh, so, okay. So tell me how this mind, this frame of mind, uh, logically, like how it makes sense, how people could think this. Because of course there's the, the, what we're thinking about, which is, you know, children needing homes, children whose parents uh, are unable to take care of them, who sign them off, uh, put them in the foster care in hopes of a better life, in hopes that they will be provided with the care that they need to uh, have the best life possible or whatever, you know, or, or let's say for religious beliefs, they didn't get an abortion and they, you know, uh, couldn't take care of a child. So they put them up for adoption or let's say the parents are drug addicts. The child protective services takes them away from their family because, you know, they don't want the children to be raised in, uh, with, uh, parents who are, who are just basically incapable of taking care of them. Uh, and then, you know, they, they're put in foster care or somewhere else in, in hopes of adoption. Right. That's the side that we see that most people think about. I think when they think of adoption, that's the side that I think about. Okay. So tell me, what is this? I mean, the, the, the instance that you talked about was someone that, that wrote, you know, I don't know, a Craig, Craigslist ad where they're like selling children or something. I mean, that seems completely illegal to me. That doesn't even seem like the same thing. I, I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't even categorize that in the same thing. So how is this being categorized? Like, how is this like even happening that this is a part of the conversation? There must be something here that I'm missing, right? That that's causing people to think this mm-hmm. way. So what is it? Is there mm-hmm. like something that I'm missing? <laughs> I feel like that's... <laughs> That's a bit more controversial. <laughs> well, well, let's dive into the reasons for placing children in foster care. Because, so this is another aspect of the, lar- the larger systemic issues. Um, 
the larger social issues. Uh, so there's a, a great deal of stereotypes. There's a great deal of uh, uh, um, uh, personal bias. Uh, there's certainly racism. Um, there are things that um, occur in society, in our culture, that lead us to think that, yes, uh, parents who are not capable of raising their children, uh, the children should be placed and then adopted into wonderful, you know, well-meaning uh, homes and families and have their forever family. Um, the other side to this, Serena, that you're uncovering uh, with your questioning and, and uh, confusion about this is why aren't we doing enough to help the birth families and birth parents to support themselves and support their oh, children? Oh, I see. Okay, I see. And this is on a global level. So referring back to the UN report, uh, the UN has taken a stance in saying we need to do more for keeping uh, families together rather than focusing on placing children in orphanages and placements and adopting them out. Oh. Uh, so this is um, a larger systemic issue, a larger social issue having for us to have to address what are the circumstances and what are the, the factors that lead parents uh, to be incapable of raising their children in the first mm -hmm. place. I mean, that is such a huge issue though, because there's so many reasons. There are so many reasons. Like there's just so many factors, <laughs> it's, you know? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we right now we're struggling to solve even just one addiction, like even just drug addiction, you know, which is just only one reason for why this happens. Uh, and then there's just, and then there's just, you know, I don't want to say bad parenting, but there's just like almost like ignorant parenting where, um, where uh, parents don't aren't necessarily addicted to drugs, but they just, you know, are neglectful to their children or they just, you know, never wanted children and they just, you know, don't really parent the children correctly. Um, and then, of course, you know, there are the other reasons where what if they didn't really want the child, but for uh, for uh, their own spiritual beliefs or whatever, like they felt like, you know, having the child was better than not having the child, but they never really planned on having a child anyway. So, I mean, yeah, it's, there's so many issues involved in this. I mean, it's just, it seems like such a big undertaking and I don't, it just seems like such a, almost like a rhetorical <laughs> rhetorical subjects, you know, <laughs> um, but I can see, I can see the benefits in definitely providing uh, parents with better access to, and resources to better able to raise their own children and not, not having the family have to be torn apart. Yes, of course, I can see the benefits of that too. However, that still leaves me the question. I still have the question I had originally with two questions. I didn't forget, but let's just start with, okay. um, why is it so difficult to adopt though? Because, okay, even if we did, even if we did, um, you know, uh, give parents a better, uh, the uh, more ability to keep their children, you know, and keep more families intact, which is great, but there are still, like e to this day, there's still a lot of kids out there who don't have families and don't have homes. And there are also parents who are unable to have their own children. And it's very difficult for them to adopt. So, and then of course, and then there's of course like uh, gay marriages that, that mm -hmm. might want to adopt. So, I mean, it's just, it's very, from what I know of the adoption process, it's not easy. And yet there's all these kids that need adopting. Like why should one take away from the other? The number of um, children needing adoption has not decreased significantly yet, not that I know of. So they're still out there. They're still in need of adoption. So why is it so hard? Do you know why? I'm genuinely curious. Like, I've always wondered, why is it so difficult? Mm, mm. I understand like, okay, people want to make sure that parents are financially stable and that, you know, they're mentally stable and that they have a good home environment. But still, I just feel like the whole, it's just, it's so, so many hoops you got to jump over. Um, and, and meanwhile, there's all these children that are 
you know, waiting for adoption. Sorry, that's my cat. Mm-hmm. Again. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, Serena, so you're, t- you're tapping into two or three other aspects to adoption. Okay. Uh, so let, so let, let's go back in time. Uh, and let's talk about how adoptions uh, started or how adoptions uh, were handled, um, uh, you know, early, say, mid uh, 20th century, um, mm-hmm. where uh, there was a, a term that was used. It was, it was uh, backdoor adoptions. So this is the era where uh, there were a lot of... Uh, say teen pregnancies uh Mm. you know teen girls getting pregnant um out of wedlock uh there was a lot of social and religious shame around uh getting pregnant um a lot of shame brought to the family a lot of shame put on these uh uh, young girls um and uh adoption was a viable option but it was a, a, a social taboo. It was not uh, okay. So what they would, uh, where this term came from was literally uh, the, um, the, the teen girl would come in uh, with, with her child and it would literally get passed through the back door to the new adoptive parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of these adoptions that occurred were uh, of the same race, um, the, the same uh, uh, cultural background, if you will. So they were able to be blended in. And the uh, adoption experience was um, uh, a, a huge secret. Uh, so as things developed, um, the international adoption uh, 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 market, if you will, began. Um, and Korea was actually the forefront of the international uh, adoption um, uh, practice uh, industry, if you, if you want to call, call, you know, call it an industry. Um, and that really began uh, with a, a family from, uh, uh, from America uh, who would fly over and pick up uh, Korean infants and babies who were, uh, again, um, uh, you know, born in uh, less favorable uh, uh, situations. Um, and uh, like they were just... Like what? Like what? Mm. So, uh, again, there were social stigmas um, about... Uh, uh, at the time, there, there, there were what were called uh, comfort women uh, that would um, uh, become pregnant. Uh, so like born out of wedlock. Born out of wedlock. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, okay. So, yeah, single parenthood, um, uh, I think, is still uh, looked down upon. Yeah, yeah, that is so interesting. No, it's it's definitely looked down upon. Um, I mean, I growing up in America, I don't even see it as a bad thing. I mean, sometimes I'm like, wow, like all the more power to you. You're a single parent, and I know that a lot of I've heard a lot of cases of women just you know um, going off and and having their own babies, you know, with the artificial insemination, and you know, being very empowered, very empowered in doing that, and feeling mm-hmm. empowered and being a single parent so in america it's i don't know at least for me and and the mindset that i've been around and what i've been exposed to yep i never really even saw it as uh, that much of a stigma because it just happens so often here but then again Mm. you know divorce rates are (laughs) quite high in america (laughs) uh, compared to korea or asia so yeah interesting um sorry i think i cut you off Uh uh-huh yeah no no worries um there needed to be some uh, legitimate way of bringing these children over, of uh, formalizing the adoption process. Uh, so um, there are uh, adoption agencies that need to be uh, licensed. That How long does the adoption process take? When they come to that decision, uh, 
what what happens you know uh, in certain states you have to go through an adoption agency you have to uh, make sure you work with a, a licensed agency um, other states so you can go to an adoption attorney uh, so the actual process can you know on average take a, a year to up to you know three four five years wow five years to adopt a child since the decision is made. That is a long time, especially considering that you, you said earlier that uh, after toddlerhood, children are considered older in the world of adopting and have less of a chance, perhaps, of being adopted. So interesting, very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I want to get a bit into the traumas since you are a trauma specialist, right? Adoption trauma specialist. So like, what do you typically deal with in your work? Uh, what do people typically go to you for? 